Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this wonderful event, the first big event for the Confucius Institute for the year of 2012. I'm Joseph Lam, the director of the Confucius Institute, and I really am very happy to have this event to begin our wonderful year of 2012. First, then, I must say that I'm extremely happy to have this event because when I saw uh, Mr. Wong's play at Chinglish in October, I was totally impressed. And totally, it hit me like a thunderbolt. Because you see, in the Confucius Institute, our mission on campus is to promote Chinese arts and culture. And as we've been doing that, we realized that there are a lot of problems in terms of communicating between cultures. Sometimes it's a lot more than just technical translation issues. It involves a lot of culture, subjectivity, and things. And I've been struggling with these issues for about, since I got this job for two, and, two years and three months now, two months now. And when I saw Mr. Wong's play, I was saying, how can he get everything so right with a one play? And if I have to explain everything, it would take me years to explain it, but he can print everything down right sharp to the bone with one play and uh, such poetic, literary, entertaining way. So, applause. So that's why I really want to bring this show here, but since I don't have the money to bring the whole show here, I think the best thing is to invite Mr. Wong and his collaborators, uh, uh, Dr. Joanne Lee and Mr. Ken Smith, to come here. Now, they are all wonderful uh, cultural elites in New York, really needs no introduction, but since this is Ann Arbor, so I'll say a few things. Uh, Mr. Wong, of course, you know, are of course the fame of M. Butterfly, which won the Tony Award in 80, uh, and then the Drama Desk Award, the John Gassner Award, and Outer Critics Circles Award. And he was also a finalist for the 1989 Pulitzer Prize. And his other famous things, Praise a Golden Child, the Fall Drum Song, so the list can go on and on and on, and he has so many honor, honors and awards, so I'm not going to list it because I'm sure you have Googled it and memorized it. So, <laughs> but the big thing is when you hear a real artist talk in front of you. And then, of course, I have to introduce his collaborators, Joanna Lee, who, Dr. Joanna Lee, who is a good friend of mine. We've known each other many years ago. Uh, he's a pianist, a composer, and now is a very important cultural producer linking China and America in many ways. And then, of course, there's Ken, Mr. Ken Smith, who is a very important uh, journalist for the Financial Times. And his specialty is writing about cultural affairs of China, introducing it to America. So I understand that Joanna and Ken, they work very closely with uh, Mr. Wong to produce this Chinglish and play, which is absolutely fantastic. It really hits your heart, and that is what I believe art and culture is about. It poetically hits you right where it comes. So without further ado, uh, our speakers. Well, this is a great turnout here. Um, we get done a lot of talking to audiences over the past uh, few months uh, in Chicago and then uh, later on in Broadway. And uh, most of the time when we do this, people have actually seen the play already. So we have to start back a little bit here. Has anyone actually in the audience seen? OK, very good. Some of you were, thank you. In, were in New York or in Chicago and saw it. Great, thank you. Uh, so we, we want to start back a little bit. First of all, to hear from the, the playwright himself just a, a thumbnail description of what the play is about, and then also to see some clips so you have an idea of what it looks like and to get a sense uh, of some scenes from the play to see how it, how it flows. So uh, to start, uh, let's hear from the playwright himself. Thanks. Um, OK, Chinglish is um, about um, an American businessman uh, from Ohio, who travels to the Chinese provincial capital of Guiyang uh, in search of a business deal, and um, discovers that there are many different levels uh, of misunderstandings that he needs to negotiate. Uh, the most superficial of these being language, 
Um, but sometimes even when you know what someone's saying literally, you might as well be speaking a different language because the underlying uh, cultural preconceptions and mindsets can be sufficiently uh, uh, different. And so uh, he discovers uh, many misunderstandings uh, in terms of business and in terms of uh, love and, uh, and romance. OK, great. Uh, I think we'll start uh, by showing some things, and we'll just sort of annotate them a little bit as we go along and see them. I think the first one that we're going to try is to, oh, yeah. The first uh, clip that we want to show is actually a very nice mashup uh, from the Chicago, the Goodman Theater uh, production, which was actually uh, how it all started uh, in June of last year. Wow. So when uh, the, the American uh, character's name is Daniel, goes to, um, goes to China, uh, he is trying to get a deal um, to make the bilingual signs for um, a, a new cultural center that's under construction in Guiyang. And the um, minister of culture, whose name is Tsai, seems to be very receptive. Uh, but his vice minister, uh, Xi'an, who's um, a female, um, appears very hostile to the project and says that um, China uh, is not, doesn't need foreigners to solve its problems. And at their next meeting, uh, Minister Tsai doesn't show up, and only the vice minister appears at the dinner. And um, she speaks some English and wants to speak to him alone. And this is from that scene. At your own risk. English writing firm. Currently enter Su's back door. Tai Kwai's sister, open door. So, will not close. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Okay, you want another one? Yeah, let's do, um, the, let's do the first translator scene. So a lot of the humor in the show um, has to do with the fact that uh, the characters who uh, would speak Chinese do speak Chinese, and we use um, projected oh, subtitles so that, um, so that the uh, non-Chinese speakers in the audience can understand what's going on. Uh, but as anyone who's worked with the translator knows, a Chicago. lot of times the translators get it wrong. Uh, so there are two scenes, uh, two moments about translation here. Chicago? Uh, no, we're based in... Oh, your firm is based in Cleveland, uh, but you've done business in... Chicago! Chicago! The minister says... Oh, 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 <laughs> uh, the minister was also born in a small farming village. Uh, Cleveland isn't exactly a farming, though I suppose it was at one time. Okay. Another? Yeah. I recently assumed control of Ohio signage and now direct all its operations. I am sorry, direct what? All our operations. 
。啊 ，Thank you。而他也是个外科医生。<笑>不不不，卡王拉先生不是医生，对不起，他是个备受敬重的商人。Well, the first time I went to China was in '93. I'm uh, a um, American-born Chinese.、Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and、um, so I didn't grow up really speaking Chinese.、Uh, and of course, when I was a kid,、uh, the Cold War was still going on, so、uh, we people didn't go to China.、Uh, I went to China for the first time in '93、uh, to see where my、uh, my father grew up, and it was a big family roots trip. And then, starting in about 2005. Um, I started going more regularly,、uh, essentially because China has become very interested in Broadway-style theater, and I happen to be the only,、um, even nominally Chinese person who's written a Broadway show. So、um, <laughs> I was called over for meetings、um, to、uh, discuss various projects,、uh, which were all very grand, and none of which ever actually materialized.、Uh, and whenever I went there,、um, Joanna and Ken were my kind of guides and fixers and translators. And bodyguards, so we have a long history、uh, with that.、Um, but having gone there, you know, sort of once or twice a year、uh, for the last four or five years, and、um, sat in、uh, on a number of、uh, business meetings,、um, I started to become kind of interested in、uh, doing business in China,、uh, both sort of. Uh, in, in, in for myself, but also as just the, that dynamic.、Um, and in 2005,、uh, Joanna and Ken took me to a brand new cultural center、uh, in Shanghai, which、um, was perfect. It was, you know, sort of、uh, Brazilian woods and Italian marbles, and a marble and、uh, a, a Japanese sound system, except for the really badly translated signs, like、um, the handicapped restroom said "deformed man's toilet." <laughs> And、um, and I began thinking about using these signs as a jumping-off point to write a play about doing business in China, but one which would deal with the issue of language, because、um, I, I think it's not something that I've seen in、um, our movies and and and、uh, stage presentations.、Uh, that most of the time you have, say, an American character who goes to whatever country, Brazil. And、um, all of the characters,、um, when he gets there, speak English, but with a Brazilian accent, and that's supposed to somehow represent the experience, and it, it, it doesn't at all.、Um, so I wanted to write a play in which、um, the Chinese characters would have the dignity of their own language,、um, essentially a bilingual play. Now the、um, primary problem here、uh, is that I am not bilingual. Um, I took a couple years of Chinese in college.、Um, I've hired tutors now and then, but basically my Chinese is, you know, virtually non-existent.、Um, so,、uh, fortunately, I was friends with a Hong Kong-based playwright named Candice Chong, who writes in Mandarin. And I asked Candice if she would collaborate with me on this project. So she became my translator, and she was with us through all, all the rehearsals in Chicago as well as all our rehearsals for Broadway.、Uh, and that's basically how we we put this show together. Okay.、Um, I, to add to that, I mean, this is a uh, uh, one major point, and and it, the idea I think morphed for you over a couple of different uh, stages. Mm -hmm. uh, the first idea I remember you were talking about that、uh, specifically in Shanghai, there was a David Mamet play to be written about business in Shanghai. Okay, I can put, I can provide the setting.、Uh, we went to Shanghai together in 2005.、Um, David also gave some talks at theater academies, music conservatories for the musical theater programs, because they were all very curious. I'm going to stand too. They're all very <laughs> curious about Broadway. They think that Broadway is so sexy. Right, great. So there we were in in Shanghai, and、uh, Ken and I have been doing a lot of cultural business there, and so we know lots of friends, no matter whether they are native Shanghai, other people from China going into Shanghai, or expats, literally from America, Europe, anywhere, now living and working in Shanghai. And、uh, just think, in 2005, and this is even before the Olympics, before the World Expo, Shanghai was still, you know, pretty,、uh, well, a very, very hot type of a city. There were parties in which we attended, in which we looked around, and David and I were the only two Chinese. I、Everybody mean, it, was it, not even Chinese. It could have been Berlin. It could have been Los Angeles. It could have been really any place in the world. The the mix was about the same, as were the languages being spoken. So there wasn't anything intrinsically Chinese about Shanghai, and I think that that sort of hit us right away. And, and David thought of the initial thing because the real estate boom was really big, that there there's something about real estate in Shanghai that could work, 
and everyone going into this misrepresenting themselves on every stage and trying to second guess what the other side would say or do. Yeah, um, I can't refer to the fact that sort of my initial notion was um, there's a, a famous uh, David Mamet play called Glengarry Glen Ross. It's the play that he won the Pulitzer for. Uh, and I thought, oh, there's a, you know, it's sort of like I could write Glengarry Glen Ross set in China. Um, but uh, one of the things that was fascinating to me was that it seemed to me that there is a window there. Uh, and and it, that window was closing then. It may have closed pretty much by now in the, in the major coastal cities, that is in Shanghai and Beijing, where you know, both countries are very interested in each other. But there are very few people who actually know what's happening, who the real players are on both sides of the Pacific, which provides an opportunity for um, American people to, or Western people to go to China and represent themselves as something that they actually aren't at home, as more accomplished than they are at home, uh, and vice versa, for Chinese people to come here and, and misrepresent themselves. And since, you know, uh, sort of lying and deception seems to be, seems to be a favorite theme of mine, uh, this, <laughs> this seemed to me this was really attractive. Yeah. Now, the, the other factor that came into this was discovering Guiyang. And, uh, which is the, the, the capital of Guizhou province. Does anyone, has anyone been to Guiyang? Guiyang, which is a southwest part of China. It's part of the pepper triangle. I think we have one hand. Triangle. Thank you. Triangle, we have one hand, it. two hands. Uh, it's right beside it? Sichuan Three. and Hunan with a very similar sense of spicy food and uh, minority populations and lots of things that, that uh, play into it. I used to refer to it as the, the Charleston, West Virginia of China because of the economic uh, disparity with the rest of the country and other, other things, um, uh, minority groups or groups that live outside the mainstream population, often in, in mountains. And um, uh, Joanna and I have done a lot of work in that region, and uh, particularly with recording minority musics of, uh, from villages and working with the museum there. But we actually um, ended up getting married in that part of the country. And uh, David came uh, actually the day after our wedding. Yeah, but, I, I sort of missed the wedding, sorry. But close enough. <laughs> but, but close enough to actually get a sense of what this province was about, and that sort of morphed the play into a different direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually was interested at that point in, in Guiyang because of my previous play, which is called Yellowface. Um, which, uh, in which uh, incorporates the music of the Dong uh, minority uh, group, which, is, which lives largely in Guiyang, and whose music I became familiar with initially because Ken and Joanna did the initial field work uh, on the Dong and, and came up with a CD, which is how I got to know the music, and I guess how I got to know you guys, sort of. Yeah, um, yeah more or less. So, um, yeah, so then we traveled to Guiyang, and um, do you want to take it from here? <laughs> wow, I can do a little slideshow. Oh yeah, you keep well, on talking. Okay, well, while she sets up, Guiyang, what was interesting about that dynamic is that it went from being a, you know, essentially a hick town to a boom town within an 18 month period. <laughs> Mo mostly because uh, President Hu Jintao's first appointment was in Guiyang. And uh, we were actually doing some fun signage because we realized that yes, since we knew David was already preparing Chinglish, I took these photos because I still could not figure out what they sell. <laughs> boss E Ming Chi. I think that's a Hugo Boss. Uh, not. Really? Yeah. I am 27. I like that one. But the thing is, okay, regardless of looking at the signs, I want you to look at actually how slick, you know, the the sharp windows are. Uh, we are talking about, as Ken said, the what is it, Charleston, if, West Virginia. If we had actually known we were doing research for a play when we were there the first time, we would have taken much better pictures. <laughs> Unfortunately, it went from uh, a very backward town into a very slick town quickly. And this is their most famous pavilion, Jiaxiolo. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I can tell you that if you read the English signs, nothing made sense, which is really sad. It is actually a Ming Dynasty uh, pavilion. Um, and I kept on thinking, oh, is there, are there ways of helping them? What happened is the English translation isn't bad, but whoever was setting it didn't know that you can't just, for example, with the word the, T-H-E, have T at the end of one line and H-E. 
at the beginning of the second line. And so it became impossible to read, unfortunately. But this is actually a beautiful view of the river that actually crosses. But this is already 2010. Look at the tall buildings. Uh, the building that actually has the conical um, atop is actually the Sheraton Hotel. Nice, nice, nice four-star hotel now. And, um, and these are, just look, these are how China is so very catching up. You know, this, just girls sitting around, you know, shopping. I mean, the shopping malls are also quite fancy. Look at this shopping mall. So this is a city in China that went through rapid change. And the nice thing is that despite that, you turn around the corner, you still have your vegetable stalls, which is what I always live for. And, and uh, people playing badminton in the middle of a square, uh, you know, but middle of, you know, just, you know, in between some buildings, and that I like. And I also still like the people wearing pajamas <laughs> crossing the street. And yet, you know, you now, while before it was all bicycles, even in Guiyang now, it is all cars. That's it. So after, uh, uh, well, actually, you want to talk about how the play came about, David, uh, in terms of, of actually being forced to write it. <laughs> forced uh, at almost gunpoint. Uh, well, I mean, it's... The, uh, the, the, the moral here is that um, it's really good to give artists deadlines because um, I started thinking about writing this play in 2005 and then I didn't write it for many years. Uh, but uh, Lee Silverman, um, my director who also directed Yellowface, I kept telling her that I wanted to, you know, I had this idea to write a play about doing business in China that was bilingual. Um, and then finally, uh, I guess in 2009, she just, uh, at the beginning of the year, she just said, okay, we're just going to schedule the workshop, which means that um, we were going to have a reading of the play. Um, she scheduled it for December of 2009 and like January of 2009, so I would have to write it over the course of that year. And by the time we got to December, I had in fact finished the first act, and we did a reading of that with, you know, just with actors in a room um, and someone working a PowerPoint in order to simulate the, the, the titles. And then I finished the second act, in January of 2010, a month later, and then we were on Broadway by, uh, I'm sorry, we were in Chicago by June of 11, and on Broadway by October of 11, so it actually happened quite quickly. And uh, in between, there was still research, because you can imagine for a play like this, um, and I think I can speak for me and Ken and David and also Lee Silverman, our director, really wanting to make sure that whatever the experience we give the audience, it's as authentic as possible. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is that uh, it, it, it even wasn't so much an issue for David, because he'd been there, and he had a very clear idea of, of the, the plot. In fact, the, the first draft of the show, has kind of the same narrative arc as what you have, what you can see on Broadway. Uh, a lot of the details have changed, and a lot of stuff has been cut and compressed. But the general idea was there from the beginning. What made it tricky was the director, and it's and it, it's not um, about getting it on the page. It's about getting it on the stage, and what does that mean to actually bring something to life? You know, there's an old uh, expression in cinema. You know, well, you know, we only shot a, a half page of the script today. And so what was that? Well, part the Red Sea. <laughs> and so the idea of what does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? All of those things that are in between the words on the page, this is what the director had to discover. And of course, we, we had this uh, a, a subsequent research trip to actually go and feel what it's like uh, in a very you know, newly booming city that is desperately trying to catch up to the rest of China. And uh, at, th at that point, the producers decided that they wanted to join us on this, this trip. So that uh, raised the stakes up, uh, you know, in terms of what we were doing and also raised the ability of what we could do while we were there quite highly. Well, I'll just give some details. Uh, July 2010, a group of nine of us went into Guiyang. Uh, that included producers, David, as well as our director, Lee Silverman, and Ken and I were kind of the bodyguards, guides, and translators, and everything else. It's not so easy to go into Guayang and say, hi, we would like to now come and meet your officials, go to the official places, and eat at the official restaurants. Not so easy. So luckily, with David having uh, done, and, and Yellowface actually won the OB Award and was also a Pulitzer Prize finalist, um, Yellowface, this play from 2007, kind of put uh, Guizhou's minority culture on the map. 
And so David went back there and actually gave a great talk. You remember that? Mm -hmm. On what is it? What is the title? Uh, the Artist in the Age of Commerce. Well, so we actually were received there as a, an interesting group of people who visit the place, and we actually did actually even spend quite a bit of time one afternoon with the local artists to get to know really what type of life do they have now. And we learned a lot from them, and these are all little bits of details that not only just David, the producers, but our director, because it's really a matter of smell, taste, and touch. Right. And, and also meeting with American businessmen who happen to be working in that part of the, of the country. You want my slideshow? Let's start. Let's look at some. Yeah, we can talk <laughs> now. Let's go. Are, are you guys enjoying the slideshow? Because I think it, it gives you a sense of really the real research, not even the play, the real research that goes behind it. Okay. Uh, you want to do notes? Start, uh, start with this. Well, okay. For, from the original time that we were in a performing arts center that shall remain nameless in Shanghai, uh, our host, whose English was actually quite good, wondered why she couldn't find David and me when she went to explain something. The reason was that we had seen the deformed man's toilet, <laughs> David's notebook came out, and we just went off in a totally different direction. <laughs> and uh, at that point, uh, and many of the signs have been replaced, actually, but uh, everyone who has ever been in this theater complex knows exactly which one we're talking about. They were that bad. Which shall remain nameless. Yes. Um, so you, next, next photo. But this is not from there. This is just, we started yeah. taking any photos that we can find that is of interest to us. And so for a week only was interesting. Uh, this is when we were in Shanghai. This is one of those famous new theaters that China was building. And so we thought that it would be good to also go and see you know, how they were building it. This is now the opened, uh, what is it called? The Cultural Plaza, the Cultural Culture Square. Square. Culture Square of Shanghai, which actually specializes in, um, in uh, musicals. This is the Shanghai Grand Theater. And behind them, they're doing La Boheme and all that. And uh, we were very much uh, greeted and had lots and lots of interesting meetings discussing, again, Broadway production possibilities. Always the word Broadway. Everybody's, oh, this is the beginning. OK. <laughs> okay. I, I, why? They we already step, laugh without even okay, telling we, we, <laughs> we, we step this back. One of the things that made it interesting and why bringing uh, Guayang uh, to life uh, it required some some extra assistance. Uh, I referred to it as the, the Charleston, West Virginia, a little bit ago. In terms of the, the the visual design and the look, it's actually more like the Albuquerque of China. Santa um, Fe, Santa Fe. Well, in, you know, more more Albuquerque, but uh, be, but anyway, it first of all, involves a lot of spicy food. It involves a lot of food that actually comes from minority populations that just happen to be in that part of the, of the uh, country. In our situation, the, the Hispanic group, the Native American group. The, and um, and the, the influences, both visually and culinarily, um, that those groups have offered have really entered the mainstream in that part of the country. And so you have very much uh, that kind of a situation here where a normal city, I mean, a normal uh, office, a normal building in Guayang just would look different from someplace in New York or Washington or Boston. Uh, and so this is an example of one of the native foods <laughs> from the Miao uh, people from Guayang, which has actually made it into the play. Into scene two of David's uh, uh, Chinglish. Uh, uh, the is dish is called sour fish soup. You, may, you want to describe it? Um, well, it's actually the first time I went to Guayang, um, uh, we had sourfish soup, and um, I'm a, a big fan of um, hot and sour, so this was the perfect dish for me. And so I, uh, when I wrote the draft of the play, I was thinking about sourfish soup, so I worked it in, <laughs> and also felt this would give me an opportunity in the future to eat more sourfish soup, which, as you see, uh, actually took place. Uh, however, the soup is not in those little horns. Um, the horns are, are wine, and... Um, uh, part of the experience of eating sourfish soup and going to one of these uh, minority restaurants uh, in Guayang is that you have um, service people in um, <laughs> in minority garb who pour wine down your throat. That's just <laughs> part of the that's part of the gig. And that also entered into the Chinglish. It's one of the lines. That's true, actually. And that was a little later that it uh, uh, one of the. The cultural minister refers to one of the reasons you should come to Guayang is because they're native people who pour wine down your throat. 
<laughs> and sing songs to you, which is right. actually exactly what happens. These two young ladies were actually singing a drinking song and pouring <laughs> the wine down your throat. And to be polite, you cannot touch that horn. So you can see that, you know, uh, next to David is actually Oscar Eustace, the artistic director of the public theater. And uh, they were drinking and eating and then more. And the thing is also you notice that, you know, these are our wonderful hosts. Behind them, this amazing, uh, you know, panoramic photo of these Meow festivals. This also eventually fed into Chinglish in our set design. So there was a lot of this type of work. You can just imagine how, ah, this is Oscar hitting the fish. Very, very, um, can you call it like borscht with something? Well, one of our, our very Jewish producers uh, was, you know, apprehensive about Eat it. Said, Jerry, for God's sake, it's, it's spicy borscht with a catfish. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, give me a bowl of that. <laughs> and so they, after that, they were fine. Okay, this is interesting. This is actually a Walmart. We decided that it is important to check out Walmart and how actually, we, uh, unfortunately, that's all I could do. This is actually, they, was, they were walking around so much, it's a little massage chair. But Walmart in China is very big business. Walmart in China, in its own way, is a, an interesting bridge of American and Chinese culture. Well, it's interesting, too, because uh, it, it has an entirely different brand, or an entirely different identity there. And we walked in uh, thinking the first time, well, you know, what's the difference? I mean, you go to Walmart in America, and everything there is made in China. You go to China, it, Walmart, everything there is made in China. But there, it's expensive. It's actually a brand name, uh, you know, with, with an American sort of prestige, recognizable logo with Walmart. Where they really uh, have built their identity is in the food section. And what you find at, at a Walmart is, is that they've made the entire situation there. It's, it's the best village wet market in town. You go there to shop for fish. You go there. I mean, they've they've entirely, you know, signified that brand, and so I think that kind of stuck in people's mind that when American stuff goes there, it's no longer American stuff. It takes on an entirely different identity, and uh, to an extent, you have to sort of surrender yourself to that and and let the 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 uh, local market help determine. Okay, next one. This is a fun one. We did our research, so we were trying to find. Western businessman working in Guiyang. We found a guy. His name is Chris. I, I forgot his last name. No, Sorry. Chris, yeah. Chris, but he's Chris from Indiana. Chris from Indiana opened his coffee shop, which is called Highlands Coffee, owned and operated by an American. It's all into the, in the sign, which this, is great. This is the corner in the world where Starbucks still does not exist. And so there's a great market for that here, for the, the, the Western coffee shop. And I think it's worth noting that, you know, some uh, people uh, who see the play sometimes ask, well, you know, why did you set it in Guiyang? Well, um, Ken and Joanna have uh, helped us understand some of the uh, reasons just kind of serendipitously because I've, I'd been to Guiyang. But also, you know, Guiyang's a city of about four million people. And there's still, at least when we were there last summer, there were still only 500 foreigners that lived there uh, on a regular basis, which is very different from the rest of China. And so therefore, you have a situation which, which is maybe like the coastal city cities 10 or 15 years ago, uh, and you know, you have, uh, so foreign-owned businesses are relatively rare. And so just asking how Chris, met, uh, Chris, Chris DeLong, that's DeLong, his name, right, Chris right. DeLong, just asking Chris DeLong, you know, why, how did you get here and all that, that went on for at least two hours of, you know, intense grilling of our American businessmen there. And uh, that was in 2010, and actually, luckily, just uh, six months ago, we went back there. He's still standing. His coffee shop is still standing. He's still doing well. Except he always says that in China, at least in Guiyang, it's not so easy to find those you know, coffee baristas. Uh, he trained some of them, and then they would go away. Or he would also say that sometimes he trained somebody, somebody would work for three months, suddenly one morning, that person just disappears and never comes back. So he has to train new staff to learn how to make coffee all over again. So that, that he said, was a personnel issue that he found a little bit difficult in China that he hasn't been able to overcome. Mm. OK, so that's all. Oh, talking. This is Guiyang. You want to say something about the? Building boom. Well, um, when I was talking about um, uh, Hu Jintao's uh, original appointment, once he became president, um, there was, of course, a national 
uh, move to build infrastructure around China and unify it and, uh, in terms of, of transportation, um, railways, highways, and of course, all of his friends from 10, 15 years ago in, in Guoyang called him up immediately to get as much of that money as they possibly could. And uh, the, the subsequent wave of that was, of course, a real estate boom that hit very shortly afterwards. Buildings that were going up for no actual purpose that anyone could think of other than there was money. It was, I mean, it's pure speculation. And the price was pure speculation. I mean, it, and um, um, there's a, another interesting book written about this period at exactly the same time called Kosher Chinese, where um, uh, a young guy who was doing uh, his uh, Peace, Corps. Peace Corps teaching for two years during this exact period was documenting his students, the young faculty, everyone changing their thinking basically overnight and trying to maintain their, their old traditions and, and their ideas of their old life with the fact that they could get really rich now. I mean, you can see the very, very, you know, all these high rises, but if you look toward the middle of the build, uh, of the photo, you see those little thatched roofs. So that was Guiyang in the good old days. And then now you have buildings just all surrounding it everywhere. And uh, it's still going on, and, uh, but it's so nice. If you look at this photo, you see the beautiful cost landscape at the back. It is a, a quite, you know, you, the climate and everything of the city is very beautiful, very good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think uh, th this relates to the play in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, not only in terms of um, efforts by um, all of us, and including Joanna and Ken, who would you know sort of travel to Guiyang and bring stuff back for our set, uh, to uh, all of us to um, to capture the authenticity of the experience, but also this whole boom, the whole transition, uh, and the amount of change that this city is going through, uh, really is reflective of the change that China as a whole is go going through. And like I said, you know, the coastal cities are maybe 10 or 15 years ahead of Guiyang. Uh, and so, t so now you go to Shanghai and you, know, you go to certain parties, you might as well, well be in Berlin. But um, certainly it's this, the pace of this change becomes an important theme in Chinglish because um, it's about not only the dislocation of the American character who goes to a different culture, but even dislocations within the country itself and different uh, uh, visions for what the future of the country is and people who can adjust to that change and people who can't and are left behind. Um, I think, uh, well, this is just more food. <laughs> but it was really interesting because we, we were lucky that the, our hosts are actual publishers of the provincial magazine. And so they were very keen and very proud, and this is something that we really appreciate, of showing you know, their own culture their own foods, things that are very, very specific. And I think that's really what transmitted and translated into Chinglish, that we are able to capture, whether it's little dolls that we had to fly in from Guiyang wearing minority costumes, all the way to the food, which is sour fish soup and so on. But it's, it's interesting. I mean, all of the food that you know, is a little bit more, I would say, you know, closer to the ground, closer to the farm than if you were living in a city. Oh, and then we were brought to the song and dance show. I will quickly go through it. David, you want to say something about the conga line? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, actually. <laughs> okay, that's it. Done. Okay. No more. No okay. more photos. Okay. So, um, as part of that trip, also the the the, re the research trip with the director and the producers, uh, we also involved ourselves in a, a little casting situation, talking to actors in China. And that was an adventure, to try <laughs> to cast a, a character who is a long-term expat living for you know, two decades in China and, and uh, uh, essentially had uh, come there for a really old sense of culture and found that, that sense really disappearing as China was moving on a fast track. Um, you want to talk about actually what it's like to cast a, a, yeah, a foreigner I mean, who speaks I, Chinese and just to, just to give a little a little more background on that. I mean, I, what Ken's referring to is one of the characters in the play uh, is uh, referred to as Teacher Peter, and um, he is um, the American hires him as his consultant. Um, 
uh, Peter has uh, lived in China for about 20 years and speaks Chinese fluently and is, is British. Um, so when I wrote this play, I felt, OK, the characters are going to be, uh, the actors are going to have to be able to be bilingual. And I thought it would be a little bit of a challenge, but not that much of a challenge to find, because doesn't everybody speak Chinese nowadays? Um, so it was a little bit of a challenge to cast the Chinese actors. Um, and when it came to casting the, the Caucasian actor, uh, that turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. I was really wrong about that. Um, and so we looked on four continents, including, um, as Ken's referring to, when we went to on this trip, uh, we also thought, okay, we might as well audition actors, uh, Caucasian actors here in China. Um, so I, I, I like to ask, does anybody, is there anybody here who has uh, been, either been a Caucasian actor in China or who has a friend or relative who is a Caucasian actor in China? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> um, and and um, uh, what's your, been your experience with that? Oh, really? We should meet him. What's his What's name? His name? <laughs> I know. I recognize the name. Hamish was busy. Didn't audition. Oh, we didn't audition Hamish. <laughs> well, Hamish, oh, yes. He has another friend. Oh, yes, yes. I'm sorry, we need a guy. We needed a guy then. <laughs> Thank you. Well, like your friend Hamish is probably doing very well, because all of the Caucasian actors we auditioned were really not particularly good. Um, it was, um, and I think what happens, it's, so, it's really fascinating as an Asian American, because you know, we become very aware of the degree to which um, Asians in this country who are actors you know, get stereotyped and, and, and put into certain uh, um, uh, two-dimensional roles. Ye yes. Mm, yeah. Oh. Great. Okay. We have people for the rest of the production. Good. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, because yeah, we could, uh, what I found was that, or we found in our auditions was that, you know, people would come in uh, and like a guy would go, oh, I've done, you know, 200 um, television shows, and he, he'd show his his book of, of um, his roles, and he'd be like. Okay, here's where I played the um, the evil doctor, and here's where I played the evil uh, soldier, and here's where I played <laughs> the evil businessman, and so you know, and, and you start to realize, am I, you know, yes, they, all they they keep getting cast as the bad guys in these uh, very quickly made Chinese serials. Um, so they developed all these bad habits as actors, and it's just sort of the flip side of what you know minorities in this country go through who become actors. Um, and as a result, we did not actually find anyone in China, although now we have a few more leads. <laughs> Thank you for the leads. But it, it was interesting. Uh, this role, Teacher Peter, requires the person to speak Chinese fluently because he has to show. He has been in China for 20 years. He knows everything. He knows the ropes. And at the same time, um, and uh, Ken and I and David also know quite a lot of friends who had been expats in China, who had lived there for a long time. And really, China has changed a lot. So friends of ours who went into China to do research in the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, uh, really, if they were to leave that place, come back to China 15 years later, they wouldn't even be able to find an address that they can recognize. Well, it's not only that, too. You have people who uh, have, you know, Ivy League NBAs who were really strong, really hot shot businessmen back in the 90s. And if they stepped off that treadmill for even two years, they could not get back on because things had moved so quickly. And the industry that they knew really well was either gone or had morphed into something different. And uh, we, so we have a lot of people who are really struggling, uh, despite having so much experience, uh, you know, chronologically in China, they have very little grasp of what's happening there now. And so I, I had met a, a number of these people, um, mostly through Ken and Joanna. And um, I was, somebody said to me, um, 
oh, well, you know, when I first came here, whatever, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, just being a white guy who could speak Chinese uh, made me very employable. Uh, and then over the years, now there are a lot of Westerners, now, now we're talking about people in the coastal cities again, uh, there are a lot of Westerners here who speak Chinese, but also have other skills. They're, it's not like they're, you know, they're architects or financial analysts or whatever, so it's not like their only skill is that they speak Chinese. Um, and so, so this person was finding it kind of hard to get a job now. And I actually found that very moving, uh, and it worked, my, worked its way into uh, what happens to teacher Peter uh, in Chinglish. So I mean, we, so we've talked, I, I think, around the plot, uh, in, partly not to spoil anything for people who, who do want to see it. Um, but I think uh, we can open it now to some questions, and that would actually um, steer things a little more in, in a different direction. Um, so anything is, is fair game. The show, um, the process. And David, the and actors, David's other work. Um, yes, exactly. I understand that Chinglish is the American version of someone from China attempting to speak our language. What is the reverse in China when an American, hopefully, is trying to speak Chinese? And secondly, could this play be in reverse in China, and how would that be depicted? Um, well, I, well, it is my hope that um, the play uh, attempts to be sort of an equal opportunity offender. Uh, that is, that it uh, certainly the initial premise has to do with these mistranslated signs, uh, and a lot of and the the examples that you saw in the clips have to do with Chinese translators getting things wrong. But um, you know, in the larger context of things. Uh, at least the Chinese are trying to do bilingual signs. I mean, we don't even really try in this country. And so um, there's several instances uh, in the play, and I think there's a, a lot of humor made uh, of um, when the Westerner tries to speak Chinese and how easy it is to screw up a phrase like, you know, wo ai ni, um, that uh, we had a lot of fun coming up with, you just change the tones a little bit and it's, you know, frog loves to pee. Um, <laughs> as well as an actual case um, where, uh, sort of a famous case where a Western academic journal attempted to put Chinese on its cover uh, with disastrous results. Um, do you want to talk about that? Oh yes. Do we? Can we? Can we actually tell them which journal is so yeah. they can Google it? <laughs> Germany, the Max Planck Institute. Uh, in 2008, I think it's yeah. the third quarter of the Max Planck Institute uh, report or whatever journal it is, and uh, somehow they had some expert, and the some expert somehow picked something that well, looked they, they like it's put calligraphy. Chinese love poetry, right? Yeah, right. Instead of Chinese love poetry, they picked out a Macau nightclub ad that they tend to put right in, in front of a door, which actually starts telling you, you know, oh, we have these cute girls, tall, thin, they all smile at you, they'll be happy, happy to, like, you know, greet you in whatever way you want and all that. So that ended up as the cover of the Max Planck Institute. <laughs> Problem. Of course, it, it created an uproar. You can Google it, you will see it. And so the Max Planck Institute recalled all of the journals, and they pasted a new design on top <laughs> of it. Now, it means that if you actually s carefully peel it off, you can actually find the old one. That's the fun part. Also, when we did the show in Chicago, this is kind of sweet and sad, but I guess the Max Planck Institute heard that they were referred to in the show, so they were very excited to come see the show. <laughs> Uh, some representatives, and then we never heard from them afterwards. Uh, actually, the Max Planck Institute was so nice that they actually shipped over that specific um, copy of the journal to them. Those were real props. You didn't know? No, yeah, talk about authenticity. We actually wrote to them, and then they sent us those magazines as real props for the stage play in Chicago and also on Broadway. I guess we sort of punked them. <laughs> so we have uh, any more questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so microphone, please. Yeah. Um, so you talk about uh, the Broadway market being really hot right now in Asia, in China, and Korea, where they're bringing in just show after show, um, and it's doing really well. Do you see that going the other way anytime soon, where we're bringing in shows from Asia into New York? Because the New York market isn't the easiest market right now to get into, but. How do you see that connection between really eager producers in Asia coming into 
Well, it's it's actually hard to actually take stuff from Chicago to New York. As you find out. <laughs> right. So taking things from other cultures, it's it's um, it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's a very competitive commercial market. Uh, the way that China has done this, and this is uh, actually what I, I write about in my day job uh, for the FT, it, uh, about the, the, the differences in, in the cultural life. Um, what you find is a lot of um, top-down uh, administrated art, basically, and things that come in for very different purposes other than commercial entertainment. And even things that are under the aegis of commercial entertainment in China come through a very different level of approval that you have here. You know, here the, the level of approval is primarily financial. Uh, there it's not. You have to go through very many levels of, of, of government uh, restrictions. Also, uh, when things get done, and, and, and there's, there is no lack of events and, and shows coming in from China if you live in New York or Los Angeles. You see a lot, but however, they're funded by outside companies and, or, or by the government. They're done, uh, actually the three Chinese tenors interestingly enough, uh, with an obvious model, um, is coming to New York. They are extremely hot as a commercial group in China, but they've now been tapped as uh, from the Beijing Tourism Board to, to represent Beijing abroad. And so they're coming in to Lincoln Center. They're having a gig with, a, with, a, with a, an orchestra in New York, but they aren't selling any tickets. It's all sort of Guanxi you know, distribution. You, you have to know people to get tickets. And it's strictly, uh, basically, a line item, public relations budget item. And yet, I can tell you that um, I also do some work for uh, international festivals. I mean, there are wonderful Chinese performing arts and arts groups and performers that are able to come out and do wonderful and, and really, you know, uh, breathtakingly excellent work. And uh, the American, the European audiences have the opportunity to see them. You, but the thing is, yeah. it's not what you call Broadway commercial shows. I don't think that has quite arrived yet, has uh, it? Well, I would say the, no, no. But the, the last 10 years, you've seen a lot more Chinese programming in the festival circuit. And I think one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs here has been the, the, the sort of recontextualization that they have, the, the knowledgeable people can present it in a way that Westerners will get it and be, and be true to the original culture, and the use of surtitles. Because basically, I mean, Chinglish didn't invent surtitles. You know, uh, even Western opera did not invent surtitles. Uh, you know, it actually, surtitles actually started in Asia, I found out, um, in, in, in Taipei. The people who, who initially brought over surtitles to America uh, in the Canadian Opera Company and New York City Opera were inspired by the fact that they would scroll the translation in Chinese at Chinese Opera in Taipei. And so they had that idea. And in, at Lincoln Center also, um, when the first big Kuhn Opera came, uh, the, the 19 and a half hour Peony Pavilion, it was uh, accompanied by an amazing translation. And it was actual real-time theater. I mean, it was not, you know, strange Chinese opera. It was actually a, a theatrical experience that anybody related to any world theater could grasp real-time in, in a, a very immediate manner. And David, so it's, you want to say it's about changed a lot titles. since then. Yeah, no, no, actually, I just want to reinf uh, sort of hop on something that you were saying about, about Broadway. Because I think it's important to, to, to reinforce the distinction between Broadway and not-for-profit uh, uh, presenting organizations. And I think there's a great future right now, as, as jo Joanna and Ken are saying, um, in uh, bringing uh, works over that, uh, that go into Lincoln Center or go to BAM or go to, you know, the, in, into the not-for-profit or festival circuit. Broadway is a very uh, strange uh, and unique uh, uh, animal, you know, and, and a very small slice of theatrical activity. Uh, and China th thinks of Broadway, and somehow that is in the forefront of their minds. And, and there's so much, I think, that people don't understand about Broadway. Uh, I remember going over there in 2005, and people saying, and there was a, a, a musical theater institute, you know, because China even then was really, OK, we're going to make it to Broadway. And the, the kids at the Musical Theater Institute had never seen a musical. Um, you know, and that, so there was that gap even then. But, even if you look at cultures that have been exposed to American musical theater and that tradition for decades, um, go to continental Europe, where, um, it's, where it's very popular. There's not really been a musical that's come out of 
Europe, with the exception of Les Mis. I mean, there's and Miss Saigon, and Miss, uh, which then sort of Miss Saigon's, but then Miss Saigon started in London. It's it well, anyway. No, it's originally in French. It was yeah. okay. So there's uh, so there's those two guys from uh, from France that it, that made it happen. Other than that, um, the only other musical I can think of that came out of the continent was Dance of the Vampires, uh, which you know didn't do very well. Um, so. so it, it's very hard. I think it's just hard even for uh, Americans to create musicals. And um, the fact is that of all the shows that go into Broadway, only 20% make money, 80% lose money. And I think that's something that the Chinese are just sort of starting to realize. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, can you come down to the microphone? Hello, uh, this is a question for David. Um, I was wondering, um, you know, you've enjoyed great success and you've endured sort of great controversy as well. And I was wondering, like, you know, at this point in your career, um, how do you feel about your relationship to sort of Asian American cultural production and sort of your responsibilities in terms of representation, but also maybe your responsibilities or interests as an artist? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've certainly uh, been through many different phases in terms of um, my uh, relationship to Asian America. And you know, the very first piece I ever did uh, was at the Public Theater in 1980, um, my play FOB. And at that point, there was um, an Asian American periodical called the San Francisco Journal, um, coming out obviously out of San Francisco, uh, that wrote a review that it set um, Asian America back 20 years, my play. And at the time, I was only 23. So, um, <laughs> you know, that kind of hurt my feelings. But then I, I realized um, very quickly that, oh, this is actually part of the, this is part of what it means to be, to be doing this, that when you have a group that's not traditionally been represented in mainstream media, of course, um, people who actually belong to that group are going to have the most investment about uh, about what you know what the content is, and I think what happens then is that uh, we want we as audience members, let's say as Asian American audience members, when a work comes along that depicts an Asian American or, or an Asian story, we kind of expect it to represent our experience. Um, and at a certain point in the process, I learned, okay, well, it's not possible for any one artist to represent an entire community. What can happen is that a community of artists can represent a community. And so I think it's important for me to do the work I believe in, and it's also important for me to do what I can to support um, other Asian American theater artists so that we can have a wider range. And at that point, I mean, you know, and, and there are a lot of great uh, young Asian American playwrights now. Um, at that point, an audience member can go, well, I don't like David's work, but I like, you know, Young Jean Lee's work. And that, when you make that judgment, to some extent, you're fulfilling the purpose of what art is supposed to do, or one of the purposes of art, which is to find out, I, I've learned more about myself, because what David's writing about doesn't seem to resonate with my own experience, but what Young Jean, Jean, Young Jean Lee is writing about does, and therefore I've learned something about myself. Uh, and in that way, the audience completes the picture of uh, performance. Um, so, and I'm sort of okay with that. I think that's the way it should work. And, and so it's good to have discussion. It's good to have people like works, not like works. And um, to, to be a focus for that uh, seems to me to be part of what I do. Another question? Anything? This is like a Chinese classroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, okay, good. Wow. Okay. <laughs> could, could we go to the mic? Yeah, please. Thank Chinese you. Chinese classroom. Ooh. Yeah, that did it. <laughs> I understand all over China, Guizhou is the home of Baijiu. <laughs> I wonder, is this part of it? Did you work this into the... Uh, Mount time. Yeah. We, we did extensive research, but no, uh, we could not make it in. Well, well, no, yeah. we did. Well, we we have a show. bottle. We have a bottle well. as a prop. We had to drink it. <laughs> because actually, it's quite hard to get. Uh, 
ironically, you know, one would think that if you go to, I don't know, the Bordeaux region, you can find some Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the case. Uh, you go to Guang, and it's really hard to find, find, find Mao Tai. How did no, you guys you eventually find it? Well, we actually got it because, uh, well, Guanxi, obviously. Uh, one of our, um, uh, the, uh, actually, the host uh, who brought David over, um, actually met with us when we brought uh, the actress, Jennifer Lim, the woman who, the, the lead actress, on, on the uh, came, came with us to go through and get a little bit of experience of what it's like in between the Chicago run and uh, uh, the New York run. And while we were there, um, our, our uh, cultural minister, model, took us out to lunch, a, a, a Baijiu lunch, and uh, we, we drank most of the bottle during the course of the day, but I had to bring the bottle back with me. He gave it to us as a gift. So I brought it back, and it's actually in the, the show, the real uh, Mao Tai, which is very, very apparently difficult to get. Um, Along with the packaging and the gift bag. Yes, the whole the whole deal is now worked in the so show. So for those of you who aren't aware of what it is, because I certainly wasn't, um, uh, you know, Mao Tai is sort of... Uh, 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 Maybe the most famous Chinese liquor, uh, and it comes from this region um, of, of Guizhou, uh, but uh, you know it's hard to get in the region. Yeah, because it it's, all goes for export, I guess. It, no, no, well, no. It, it goes yeah. well. It's it, it's it goes to Beijing basically and Shanghai, and all of the. It, it's the national toasting beverage, and as China gets richer, there are many more toasts that go on. <laughs> and unfortunately, the, the production has not really uh, stepped up. So it becomes very, very high end. And, and China being China, there are many lower grades and many outright fraud grades of this stuff. And uh, it, it became famous, I think, um, during the, the Nixon Mao meetings, because that was the first time that Americans really wrote about it. And I think that the, um, uh, the New York Times wrote about it as jet fuel with a hint of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a very, it's a very fierce beverage. And they, they drink it in very small uh, glasses. Usually uh, drink it in shots in one to uh, bypass all sensory apparatus. And in the play, uh, teacher Peter, uh, having offended the minister uh, at a certain point in the story, uh, comes to apologize to him towards the end of the play and brings uh, the prop bottle of Mao Tai that these guys brought back. Now, it's a little bit of a stretch of reality because I don't know that Teacher Peter would have been able to actually acquire nor afford an actual bottle of Mao Tai, but I thought it was okay. <laughs> My question is also to David. When you travel alone, not with, West, with, with Rich specifically, do people in China assume that you're Chinese and approach you as Chinese, and are there difficulties? Or is it basically that the dress, the habit, the behavior, the body language immediately gives you away? And part of the reason why I'm asking this is when I'm traveling with my husband, he, lo he is Chinese, and he's a perfectly, he's, ne he's been here a very short mo time. When he's by himself, nobody doubts he's Chinese. The moment we're together, he's either a Haigui or someone who just came back from America or an a assumed to be an ABC. People ask him, do you speak Chinese? So does the opposite happen that people just assume you're Chinese? Or how is this experience? Uh, Basically, nobody from? ever assumes I'm Chinese, oh. um, <laughs> except you know here in America. Um, no, no I, I mean, it's interesting. I was just, I mean, if not even in the mainland. I was just, um, last month, I, I went to um, Manila and Singapore for some stuff. And everybody assumes I'm Japanese, which I find is interesting. Um, and, and I keep trying, I'm actually asking around to, you know, when I meet Chinese people, I, like from China, I'm like, why do people, everybody think I'm Japanese? Uh, and some people think it's the hair, some people think it's, you know, they have some, some facial hair, I don't know. Um, but really what, you know, sort of on a, on a deeper level, um, I remember sort of being a kid and going to Taiwan and, you know, just sort of meeting my relatives over there who were, and my cousins would be like, well, you're a Chinese. How come you don't speak Chinese? And so I feel like, you know, when I started to go back, I had this feeling like, oh, you know, everyone will be, the Ch real Chinese people will be sort of vaguely ashamed of me uh, because I'm such a lousy Chinese. And, um, and I actually found that was not the case. Um, after they realized I wasn't Japanese, um, they, um, everybody's, you know, I think it's because China has always been so large and diverse in its own way that uh, I'm an overseas Chinese, but I'm still a Chinese. Uh, and I actually found that quite moving and sweet.
You made reference to uh, Miaozu in your pictures. Do you know the American name for Miaozu? You Mong. mean the Hmong? The Hmong. Yes, because yeah. they are all the same people. Actually, everywhere outside of China, they're known as the Hmong. Yeah, I don't know why, but uh, that's how they brought back a lot of Im uh, immigrants, the relatives from Guiyang. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm uh, just going to ask a little bit more about the language of the play. And so uh, my parents are from Shanghai, and so when I grew up in our household, we, we didn't speak Mandarin. We spoke Shanghainese. And so does um, Guiyang have its own like regional dialect? And then did you guys, um, in, in the clips we saw, um, I think everything was in Mandarin. Was it like a specific artistic choice to include all the, all the dialogue like as Mandarin, or is there the local language uh, mixed into the play? I think there are several ways to answer that, and, I, and we should probably all take a crack at it. Uh, um, <laughs> Yes, the language there is really uh, very difficult to manage. It's, it's influenced by local dialect from Han Chinese. It's influenced by a lot of the minority languages that go on, most of whom don't actually have a written language. Or if they did, it, it was uh, basically their adaptation opinion uh, that, that uh, the Chinese government uh, put in after 1950. But basically, um, uh, it really is a dialect, and and in one way, it, it, that it, it makes a lot of sense. The the, the West Virginia connection, because uh, I have no idea what they're saying down there a lot of the time in West Virginia, and and it's it's very much the case in Guizhou. The uh, the dialect is heavy. Things are the the and the the Guizhouhua, the the local dialect, is pinyinized in dialect, so it's not standard Chinese pinyin. And so, which I can follow because my sense of opinion is, is approximate at best, and it drives uh, Joanna up the wall. Um, for this, for the purposes of this play, not even Chinese people would understand, for the most part, what the people were really saying if we were legitimately accurate. So, what we aim for is more of a sort of BBC level, CCTV level Chinese that is standard with a few local um, adaptations that come in. Uh, yeah, also, I think that you know, it was hard enough to cast this, <laughs> <laughs> trying to find Mandarin speaking and English speaking bilingual actors with green cards. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, the thing is also, uh, it's, it's really a matter of you know, practice and dialect coaching. Uh, maybe one of those days we will try total Guiyang dialect. Yeah, I guess it really depends Guiyang. on, you know, yes, when we do the show in Guiyang, that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the question is, do we have any plans to bring a play to Ann Arbor? Um, we have plans to, um, uh, we, I, I think it is likely, I mean, we're still putting together the, the, the sort of details, so I can't speak about it too specifically, but it is likely that we will be touring some American cities uh, after New York, and we are also trying to put together an Asian tour. Um, and I think if Probably a national tour would if, uh, honestly probably not come to Ann Arbor because we're really, we would, I think we could only really do it in sort of four or five major um, US cities. Um, however, if anyone wants to do a local production here, um, that leaves that, that you know, possibility wide open. Yes. Do you find it easier to, I would say, sell Asian Asian themes as opposed to Asian American themes and do you have do you have a do you deal with how do you deal with that tension and do you feel like you have to sneak in Asian American themes to make them more marketable to the mainstream audience uh, I think in general it is more uh, easy to um, there's there's more interest from the mainstream audience in Asia per se than in Asian America and I feel like you know, I work on some projects that are Asian American, some that are, you know, set in Asia, such as this, um, and uh, you know, and then obviously some things that aren't Asian. But um, for me, it's a question of what am I interested in next. I, I'm not really that market driven in terms of what I want to write. Um, this play came about because I was traveling to China, and all, it all of a sudden became interesting to me to write a play set there. Um, and then once I've written the play really just who wants to produce it and how. I mean, Yellowface is a play that's very American, my previous play. 
um, and doesn't really have, except for the fact that there is, there's the use of the dong music. Um, other than that, it's, it's a very American play. Um, and um, so that ended up going to the public theater. And yeah, if someone had wanted to take it to Broadway, I would have said fine, but nobody wanted to take it to Broadway. Um, so I just, uh, you, I think you write the play, and then you, uh, or I write the play, and then I find out who wants to do it and in what venue. My question was uh, similar to the question asked earlier about other venues that you might be showing them. Hi, David. Um, I have a question. So I, I, you mentioned earlier that you've been to China since many times since 2005. And I noticed a lot of your work have Chinese elements to them. So you know, being someone who's been to China you know, since 2005, where do you find the, you know, the inspiration? Like, wh where does your creative um, process derive from? Um, um, you know, I, I actually f find it interesting that I continue to be, um, particularly when I uh, go to writing my own plays, I keep writing about East-West issues or about being Asian American or, uh, or international issues. Um, so apparently, uh, this continues to be uh, fascinating to me. I usually write because there's a question that I don't understand. Uh, there's something that fascinates me, um, but um, I, I, I don't, and I have a, a lot of um, confusion about it. And so I write the play to find out how I really feel about this issue deep inside. So in the case of Chinglish, um, it was largely motivated by, my, by the question of, well, how do I feel about um, you know, the rise of China, uh, quote unquote. Um, and that's what inspires me, what inspires me, you know, it, it's, it's just, what am I interested in? What do I find fascinating at any given point? Um, and right now, I seem to be on some kind of an international, international kick, um, which may remain, or I may start getting interested in something else. Hi, I'm Emily Lawson. I'm a lecturer in Asian Pacific Islander American Studies. Welcome to Michigan. We have about a 15% Asian American student population here. So David, I wanted to ask you if you can perhaps talk to some of our students and tell them like some of them are, a lot of them are majoring in engineering like I was supposed to oh, 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 and didn't. Um, and how your family took you going into playwriting and maybe some advice you may have for any of our aspiring uh, playwrights and actors. Okay, Thank great. You. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my parents are immigrants. My father's from Shanghai, and my mother's uh, Fujianese from the Philippines, and they met uh, as students at the University of Southern California. Um, and so, you know, my mom uh, was a, a pianist, so she had some familiarity with um, a career in the arts, uh, but you know, nothing in the theater, and there was certainly not the expectation that I, as the oldest child and only son, was going to end up going into playwriting. Um, so I saw some plays my freshman year in college, and I thought, oh, I think I can probably do that. Um, so I started writing plays in my spare time, and part of the thing about you know, Chinese parents as a broad stereotypical generalization <laughs> is that, um, you know, as long as you get good grades, you can do more or less any, whatever you want in your spare time. I mean, to some extent, it's the premise of Justin Lin's movie, Better Luck Tomorrow. If you get good grades, you can murder people, and it's okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, so I was just writing plays in my spare time, and, and they didn't really care. Uh, but then this, uh, I wrote my FOB to be done in my dormitory, and um, I showed it to my dad, and you know he'd never really seen a play, read a play before, and he saw some swear words, and he was like, "Oh, I send you to this fancy school, and you write this junk." But um, <laughs> but then he told my mom when we were doing it in the dorm, "Okay, well, we should go up and take a look at it, and if it's good, we'll encourage him, and if it's bad, we'll tell him to stop." <laughs> um, and after they saw the performance in the the dormitory, my father was like, you know, in tears, and because he was very moved by it. And after that, he was uh, very, you know, he was quite supportive and things happen quickly for me so it kind of reinforced that and I was lucky but I have to give you know give them a lot of credit as immigrant parents for being supportive so I would say that you know there's all this thing about 
you shouldn't go into the arts because it's unstable and it's, uh, and I don't know what a stable profession is, <laughs> really. I mean, you know, you, if you do something because um, you're trying to play it safe and it's not something that you really care about and you go into, you know, if you love engineering, great, but if you, if you go into engineering just because you think you're supposed to and it's safe, and then the economy changes, the, you know, the needs of the profession change, uh, technology goes forward and things get outmoded and then you have to change a profession. And then, what was the whole point of that? I mean, I don't think there is such a thing as a totally secure profession. So if you do something that you love, you're likely to be working really hard at it and um, it, it's not gonna feel like work. And um, I think you're just as likely to be successful. Um, so. It's, I don't understand this notion of trying to do something because it's safe, because I don't think anything is safe. Life involves risk. And um, so to young artists, I would also say, it's, not, it's impossible to know what is or isn't going to be commercial. And in a way, that's a blessing, because you might as well just write what you really believe in, and that way, if you, uh, once you finish it, you've already succeeded. And then if you get commercial success, that's like the icing on the cake. But it, it, success is sort of the icing on the cake, not the cake itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have a question along the questions they just asked about, uh, my question probably is not safe for you on the, on, the, on the ticket side, on the Broadway. For the cross-culture, there are two sides cross-culture. Uh, currently in American, there are a lot of Chinese students uh, study here, a lot of new business from Asian, Japanese. Japanese had a, a lot of investment uh, during the 80s and end up is not very success. And Chinese has started to try to invest into the US. So there are a lot of immigration in China uh, here, the Chinese here. So there are a lot of stories could be the miscommunication for the outside into American society. Do you have any plans to, to reflect that, to write a play? Reverse Chinglish. Yeah, I mean, oh, that's right. Somebody else asked about reverse Chinglish, I think, earlier. Um, you know, to some extent, I feel like uh, that the, the subject of um, immigration and arrival and assimilation and those sorts of misunderstandings, um, I feel like I've written a fair amount about that already in, in sort of some of my earlier Asian American plays, and I may very well write about that some more. But uh, in a way, that is the subject that I have most uh, easy access to uh, personally because that reflects my experience, my parents' experience. Um, and yes, there, I think the proportion of new immigrants is larger now. I mean, it's interesting to me that when I was a kid, um, the majority of Asian Americans were born in this country. Um, and so when people would sort of stereotype us as foreigners, it, it was, you know, it was statistically untrue. Um, now it's still a stereotype, but statistically the majority of Asian Americans right now um, have been born someplace else. So there is the, um, the, the, there are stories now that are different in specifics than the immigrant stories of my youth, um, but I think the dynamic is, is somewhat similar, and I may very well go back to writing about some of those. Um, I'm a musical theater student right now um, here at the university, and um, race and my skin color is something that I have to deal with on a daily basis, and it's a fight that you know you, we have to deal with every day. Um, how did that affect you as a playwright? You know, was there ever a difference between being an Asian playwright and just becoming a playwright, and how did you get over that obstacle? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think I've, at the beginning of my career, I've, when I started to realize that I was writing plays um, that had to do with Asian or Asian American stories, um, I, I remember very specifically thinking to myself, you know, I don't see why I can't write about these stories and have as good a career as Sam Shepard, who was sort of you know my my idol as a, uh, as a young playwright, um, and uh, so I felt like that career path, if you will, should be able to be created, um, and. In terms of the whole, you know, Asian being an Asian American writer and, and those uh, that category, 
Uh, I've gone back and forth. There have been times when I've you know, liked the label. There have been times when I haven't liked the label. And at this point, I feel like, you know, I'm able to write what it is that I'm interested in. And um, I continue to be largely interested in East-West issues, but I also write a lot of, you know, uh, musicals, operas, whatever, that uh, do not, uh, are not about Asian stories. Um, and as long as I can do that, uh, you know, every, uh, every artist, I think, gets labeled in one way or another. If you think of David Mamet, you th th it may not be his race, but you think of a particular type of testosterone play with a lot of F-bombs. You know, if you think of Sam Shepard, you think of the American West. If you think of Tony Kushner, he's the sort of gay socialist, you know? And, and I think we all get labeled. Um, and the reality is, I do write plays largely about um, Asian or Asian-American subjects, and so I think, it is just literally true. I'm Asian American and I'm a playwright. So if you call me an Asian American playwright, that's true. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wang, thank you so much and uh, your companions for the visit. I, I remember you brought um, M. Butterfly to Stanford back in the late 80s or early 90s. It was quite an event when that happened. Um, and I've been a fan since then. But you, you mentioned the East to West. Uh, uh, binary or dialogue, and I'm curious if you thought about the north-south axis. Uh, so I have a title suggestion for future work: either Changnyol or Changlish, mm -hmm. to explore the overseas experience with, say, Chinese in Sonora, Guatemala, Cuba, and even their descendants are in the states. That's the Changlish part of it. Uh, so I encourage you to, to think about bringing your talents even to a broader question. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea, actually. And I, 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 I'm, I will probably, I'm actually working on a play that has to do with, um, which is not exactly the same, but with the Philippines, because my, you know, my mother's family were Chinese in the Philippines, but to sort of go into um, the Chinese communities in Central South America and the Caribbean, that, that could be a lot of fun. So thank you. <laughs> it's about time. Do we have time? Can I ask a question? Catch one? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so, like yourself, I was born in LA. Uh, uh, okay, where in LA? I, I grew up on the west side, Culver City, and parts of LA proper. Okay, cool. Um, so, I'm Japanese American, but I grew up speaking, you know, nothing but English, um, and never went to Japan or China until a couple summers ago. Um, but the interesting thing to me is I was just back in, in, in LA, greater LA over the break, and I was sort of going exploring in the San Gabriel Valley just to find better food since we live here, and food, Asian food's not so great. Um, though it's getting better. Um, and I was just shocked at how much I couldn't even order good food or find the decent restaurants if I actually hadn't lived in Shanghai the previous summer. So I'm just curious how much when you're in Flushing, New York, or in, you're in Silicon Valley now, or in San Gabriel Valley of LA, and it's just changed so dramatically, just like some of these places in China have. You just have these giant Asian and Chinese shopping malls everywhere, and the signs are mostly in Chinese, and the waiters and waitresses speak mostly Chinese. How, do you, do you, how would you compare those experiences to the ones you're writing about uh, in Chinglish? I mean, I think there actually is some parallel. I, and I, I, I often say that, you know, in terms of trying to navigate across the language barrier, I didn't have to go to China in order to have that experience. I mean, I've kind of had that experience growing up with my, you know, my grandfather. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, where it comes to the changing landscape of some of these communities, I mean, I grew up in San Gabriel. And when I was, in, uh, when I was a kid, uh, there were not really many Asians there. It was mostly Chinese, uh, I was, I'm sorry, it was mostly Caucasians and Latinos. Um, and so, as a matter of fact, my parents were, uh, this was before the passage of the Fair Housing Act, obviously, were uh, not allowed to buy a house in Monterey Park because they were Chinese. And now anyone who knows Monterey Park, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a Chinatown. Um, so um, it, I go back to San Gabriel now and all the, places that used to be Mexican restaurants are now Chinese restaurants. Um, and it, uh, I can go and try and make my way through, and it's kind of like being in Asia. Or I can go with you know, relatives um, or Ken and Joanna or something. <laughs> so, maybe one last one anywhere? No? Well, maybe we've not then. Maybe, let me ask one little yeah. question. Then. Are you guys trying to make this wonderful play, which can be appreciated on so many levels, into some kind of a movie and reach oh. a large audience? You answer. 
Okay, um, I'm not at liberty at this moment to disclose the details. Um, we, I, we're hoping to make an announcement in the next uh, week to 10 days, actually. Uh, but I can say that uh, uh, it, it does appear that the, uh, Chinglish will be a movie. So maybe on that note, we will close this session because I really urge you to go to New York uh, or when they got on the national tour to go to the nearby big city to see it because it is a so wonderful play that you really can appreciate on many levels as entertainment or the deep cultural discourse. So until then, we will have to wait until the movie comes out, I hope. Yeah. Uh, and I can also give you some information. Well, we actually have some flyers for the play here, so you can pick them up. Apart from that, is the website is very easy, www.chinglishbroadway.com. You can also tweet us. Our Twitter handle is, I love doing that, Chinglish B way, at Chinglish B way. At Chinglish B way. So if you tweet us and all that, it's really amazing what social network and networking is happening and how it's changing the whole landscape. We have talkbacks in which, as the people who had finished seeing the show and was at a talkback, and they were tweeting at the same time. And it is really great to be able to share information, and thank you.